All right. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we're really excited today to welcome back our speaker. We'll get to him in just a second. Right now, we've got five classes from across North America across North America and Europe joining us. Sorry, we, we so seldom have great Europe classes. So let me give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. I know they won't be able to, we won't be able to hear them, but we've got Miss Pinker's grade eights in Salem, Virginia. So if you guys want to do a wave, awesome. We've got Mr. Uh, Lavogue's grade sixes in North Palm Beach, Florida. Hey there. Hi. Hi, Hi everybody. Hi. Hi. So, we've got Mr. Richards. Also, they can't, we can't hear them, but Mr. Richards' grade six sevens class in Amherst, on, Amherst, Villa, Amherst View, Ontario. I'm in Ontario. I can get this right. We've got Miss O'Brien's grade sixes in Candleford, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hi. And very excitingly joining us all the way from uh, Lark Hall in Scotland, we've got Mrs. Moscardini's grade seven classes. Hi, guys. Hi. Awesome. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. We're joined live also in the UK by Ollie Hunter Smart. He is a world adventurer and explorer. He joined us doing a kayak adventure down the entire Amazon River back many months ago. And then just for good measure, because he had to do something else, he walked India from north to south. So he's going to be sharing those adventures with us today. He's doing a documentary on them right now. And without further ado, we'll turn it over to Ollie. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go straight in basically. Um, so I've spent the last sort of um, couple of years really trying to lead an adventurous, more adventurous life. And um, so I guess it started when I was about 14 uh, years old. And I undertook, um, in the UK, we have something called Duke of Edinburgh Award, and it's an outward bound type course. Uh, so I did that between the age of 14 to 18. And then at the age of 18, I went to Belize and I went traveling for six months. And I spent two months teaching in a school, teaching English and a bit of science. And then I spent two months on a conservation project. And um, there I was helping rebuild a ranger station that had been knocked over by the hurricane in one of the national parks. And I had an amazing time, but my favorite moment really was a two week trek through the jungle. And it really opened up my eyes to adventurous travel and the different kinds of extreme environments that we have across our planet. So that's kind of what got me into traveling and an adventure and since since uh, going to Belize I really wanted to get back into the jungle I loved my time in that environment um, you know and I went off to work I worked in London uh, doing an advertising job uh, but about four years ago I just felt like I needed to kind of escape that a bit um, so I decided that I wanted to go back to the jungle and given that the Amazon has so much rainforest that was the place I wanted to go now you'll see in this picture, there's actually not very much jungle uh, in there. This was actually quite early on in the journey. It was a couple of hundred kilometers from the source of the river. So it was up in the mountains. So this is just the route that we, that we planned. I did the journey with a friend of mine and the yellow section that you can see there, uh, hopefully you can see that line there. That was the section that we walked uh, and it was about 600 kilometers. So uh, 450 miles roughly. Then the red section is where we started kayaking and the red section is notoriously dangerous for pirates and for tribes and for drug traffickers. So um, they kind of control the river there. And then the white section, well, that's just uh, it's, it's a very long way. And we also paddled that whole section all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean there. So we spent quite some time trying to plan this journey. It's, as I say, like I just come out of a job in advertising and I wanted to do this big expedition, but I had no idea about how to go about it. So I spent a couple of months just trying to work out how we could arrange a guide in the country, uh, purchasing kayaks and, and all the equipment that we'd need for the journey. And it's not something I'd done before, so it was really daunting to start with. But I discovered that if you just break a project down into tiny manageable pieces and slowly chip away at it, it becomes much easier. And that's, I think, 
that's that's the thing with a lot of kind of big impossible tasks is if you break them down into small little pieces then actually they become more manageable and you'll reach your goal so no matter how much planning you do there's always some chaos that going on last minute and and this is a picture of us just trying to reorganize our kit so we've flown out to peru um, we've landed with everything we needed but we were just packing it into different um, bags and containers to to send to different points along the river but we actually made it to the start line and with the help of a local we found the source of the amazon river and it was just an amazing feeling actually getting to that point you know having spent so long planning just to get to the start point that was a, a magical feeling so we started walking along the river and we were following it as closely as we could and being a geographer this is the kind of stuff i love it was just like being on a field trip, I could see these amazing meanders or the mountain formations and so on. And I knew exactly from my geography days how those had been formed and created. We would camp next to the river and we'd, um, we'd wake up with ice on our tents. So we were about four and a half thousand meters above sea level. So it was incredibly cold. And because we planned for a jungle expedition, we hadn't really prepared for those kind of conditions. So you can see here, uh, we've got some very thin tops, which someone had given us just before we set off for the mountains, but we really weren't prepared for those kind of conditions. So families would then take us in and they'd give us food and a place to sleep out of the cold for the night. But it was a great insight into their lifestyle. And slowly but surely, we worked our way down the mountains and into the valleys below. And that's really where things began to warm up. And we actually reached the jungle, my favorite environment to be in. And I was so excited having reached this point. So we then spent the next three months. The, the walking part had taken us a month and a half to do. We then spent the next three months uh, paddling along the Amazon River. And the jungle. I think is just a beautiful environment to be in. You've got these huge trees that overhang this really narrow river and you've got birds flying about and bugs buzzing all over the place and um, it's just it's a it's an assault on all of your senses. But by this stage we're in the red zone that that section I mentioned is notorious for tribes and uh, drug traffickers. So you have to get permits to travel through this section um, and you know, we had a guide that would help us arrange these permits and, and also speak to the locals as we as we traveled through. But it really wasn't plain sailing. So we got stopped a couple of times in this section. Uh, every day we would get pulled over by people kind of standing on the riverbank. They'd shout over and, and pointed a, a shotgun in our face. Um, and it was all quite hostile until you showed them that you had the right documentation, the right permits to be in that environment. And, and then the guns were lowered and you were welcomed in and you were given a welcome drink and some food and so on. But, you know, that was, that was kind of river life. It wasn't too long before the river actually began getting wider and wider. And as we approached, the, there's, a, there's a tri border of Peru, Colombia and Brazil, temperatures really started getting much, much hotter and the humidity as well became insane. And so, you get these re really impressive thunderstorms that just appear middle of the afternoon, pretty much religiously, um, and they would just cool us down for the, for the evening. So we would maybe spend like maybe 10, nine or 10 hours a day paddling. We'd take an hour off uh, for lunch where we, we would just sit in the shade and on a riverbank somewhere. And, and that's when we'd eat our, our lunch really, uh, which was just protein with some oats in. So really minimal, uh, kind of daytime food um, we'd snack a little bit but not too much and then we'd we'd have mornings and evenings as our main meals <laughs> so I'll just explain what's happening in this photo so we just camped on this riverbank and one morning I'd gone down to the river to fill up my water bottle and it was the water was really dark and murky and as I retreated I got this sudden shooting pain in the side of my ankle and I got out of the shallow water and uh, sort of went over to my tent to inspect it. And I found a little hole in the side and I'd been bitten or stung by something. I had no idea what it was. But within a couple of minutes, my legs started to go numb. And it went numb right up to my thigh. So I was beginning to get a bit worried by this. And 
being in the middle of nowhere, we were about 50 kilometers from any community around. Uh, I thought, right, the only thing I can do is, is call one of my doctor friends and see what they suggest. So I phoned up and uh, I took an antihistamine and paracetamol to sort of get rid of the pain and, and hopefully the antihistamine would um, reduce any kind of reaction that I was having. And uh, she suggested that Taryn, my mate, would should pee on my, on my ankle just to see if that would draw out the sting. It actually did nothing at all. So in the end, uh, she, she recommended that we just boil up some water and, uh, and you submerse your, your ankle in the water and it slowly draw out the poison from your, from your foot. So uh, that's, that's what's going on. But it was uh, quite an, a, a dangerous environment to be in. So here you can see I've been paddling for some time now. You can see the length of my beard and, you know, I'm looking pretty shattered. But in fact, we were nearing the end of the river. And by this stage, it had become tidal, which meant there were very few places to stop. And we would try and stop in little villages or towns, uh, which meant that we could get out the kayaks. But sometimes there was just nothing nearby. So we would pull over into the mangrove and we just have to wait it out before the tide uh, would turn again and then we could we could continue paddling so it was incredibly tiring but we did eventually reach the Atlantic Ocean uh, and we traveled 6,000 kilometers from that original source it was four and a half thousand miles and it's a really funny feeling when you get to the end of an expedition because you're aiming for a finish line that you've made up and there's no one else there to really celebrate with you other than your teammates so it's um it's always very funny these these expeditions so that's just a really brief summary of my amazon journey and then as jo uh, jesse said last year i decided that i wanted to walk the length of india it seems crazy but there was one thing that really interested me and that was indian independence and partition into what we now know as india pakistan and bangladesh and it took place in 1947 now i, I watched a film um, uh, about this period of history and I thought it tells me a lot about the the British side of the, the the issue but it doesn't tell me anything about what it was actually like to live through that period of history huge numbers of people were killed as a result of the violence surrounding the partition of India and 14 million of people were forced to flee their homes and resettle elsewhere and it was all based on religion trying to divide uh, a country out based on religion. So I just thought I, I need to go and find out more about this. Now India's fascinated me for a long time. There's a lot of colour, the vibrancy. So this seemed like the perfect excuse for me to go and visit. So I decided I was going to walk from the very top of the country near the disputed border between India and Pakistan right up here. And I would travel all the way through all of these dots are kind of important historical places. And I would continue all the way south down to Kanyakumari. And as I would go, I would try and ask people their stories and their experiences of, of independence and partition. So this is me having just set off in the Nubra Valley. And you can see the landscape is really bleak. It's really dry and there's no vegetation. And this area is known as a high altitude desert but it's not warm in any sense. In fact, well, during the day it was okay, it was sort of maybe 15 to 20 degrees, but at night time it plummets down to about minus 10. And, and I was camping in this area, so I had to make sure that I had the right kind of uh, clothing and equipment for, for sleeping out at night time. You can see all the kit on my back as well. So I climbed up over up and over Kardungla, which is one of the highest motorable roads in the world. It's about five and a half thousand meters up. And it was amazing seeing how my body reacted to that because uh, it began to get affected by the altitude. And altitude is a really funny thing. It affects different people in different ways. But I found that my, my breathing became much harder and I just had no control of my legs. And aside from it being icy, I just felt uh, as if I was watching myself from kind of a bird above or a plane above and I could just see myself skidding up and down this this road but when we got to the top it was just relief it was awesome feeling to get there 
So I covered another four of these really high passes, but there weren't any roads on the other on the other ones. And so I hired some guides and porters, and we we followed these mountain trails. And as we were heading down these sort of very steep slopes, covered in snow, I would sink down into the snow because of the weight of my bag. Now my bag, this is the bag I decided to take, and I called it Zo, which is a type of yak in India. And a, a yak is a sort of a cow-like animal that they use in the mountains to carry things about about the place. They're really sort of they're huge and really hairy. So it seemed very apt to call my bag Zo. And it was a canvas rucksack that I bought on eBay for about fifty dollars because I didn't or 50, um, forty pounds, fifty dollars, basically because I didn't want uh, something brand new and shiny and high tech. It just didn't feel like that would fit in within the environment of India. But obviously, I didn't check it properly because within a couple of weeks, really, the uh, some of the leather straps started giving way because it was it was about fifty years old. My bag. So, um, yeah. Note to self: never take vintage kit with you. <laughs> so, um, but given where I was, you know, I was on these small trails, so. I just had to make repairs with what I had, and I was really lucky to have some string and enough string to make the repairs I needed to. But my bag and shoes continued to to give me a huge number of problems throughout my journey, um, and you can see you know, the actual frame of the bag broke, and and the shoes also had to get stitched up as well. So eventually, the snow began to melt, and things started becoming greener. And it was magical because I came down from—you can see the snow right on the top of the hills that up here—and I came down through this valley here, and things really started to warm up. So it was like I'd gone from huge wintry snowdrifts through spring and summer all in one day, um, and it happened over about sort of 20, 25 kilometers. Once I was out of the mountains, I then followed the railway down to Delhi and it got me away from the busy traffic and, and so on. But also I knew that it was going to be dead straight and would head to Delhi. And it was great because there were these milestones along the side of the railway that told me how far I still had to go. And I should point out that other people also walk along the edge of the railways in India. Um, there are paths. Um, of sorts along the edge, um, sometimes not that easy to follow, but um, you know, it's it's not as dangerous as it might sound. And then I hit the streets of Delhi and these just the traffic was insane. At times there were points where I just physically could not get between the vehicles as I was heading into the city. It was just madness for me. And in Delhi, I took a little bit of time out and I, I went to visit this is Rashtrapati Bhavan, uh, which is the Viceroy's house. It's where the, the governor of India. Uh, who was British used to live and it's an incredibly impressive building and and all, the, all of the buildings in this this part of Delhi are very similar they're massive um, and they really wouldn't look out of place in the UK so by now I've reached Delhi which is this dot here and the areas that were most affected by partition uh, particularly the violent areas was this bit here uh, place, an area called Punjab this here is the line of uh, India on this side and Pakistan on this side. So that's where the line of control uh, or the, the border was created. And then Rajasthan here and Gujarat here. These areas were most affected by partition. And then there was a bit over in West Bengal here. And this is now Bangladesh here. So that used to be part of India. So I've reached Delhi. And uh, as, I, as I continue, I began to ask people questions, and uh, this is one particular woman that I spoke to. She was about, um, uh, about I think, what she about fifteen at the time of partition, but she remember really clearly remembers her mother handing over the keys to their house um, to the neighbours. They were Muslim neighbours, and, and she was a Hindu. They handed over the keys to the neighbours and said, "Can you just keep an eye on the house?" Uh, for a couple of weeks while we um you know we're going away for a bit um because of the violence but we'll we'll be back so for them partition sort of seemed like a temporary thing and that they'd be back in a couple of weeks but in reality they never got to return back to their homes and i continued to hear similar kinds of stories um about the way people traveled they traveled with these um 
sort of uh, bullock carts. So literally the livestock would, cows and um, horses and so on, would pull the carts with as many possessions and people as possible uh, while they were migrating. It's a really traumatic period of history for a lot of people. The inspiration for my journey had actually been Mahatma Gandhi, and he was a really prominent figure in the 20th century. Uh, he spent a vast part of his life campaigning for independence of India from the British. And ultimately, it was given to India in 1947. So Gandhi is very much considered the father of the nation, and his face appears literally everywhere. It's on every single banknote, um, like the Queen is in the UK, uh, and I think maybe Canada as well. Um, uh, but also, he's there are statues in every town or village. Um, he's, he's just absolutely everywhere. So I visited Gandhi's home, which was the start of the Salt March route. And now the Salt March was a protest that Gandhi organized against the British salt tax that had been imposed on the production of salt in India. And it was earning the British in India a lot of money, um, which would then pay for obviously um, uh, all the, the, the military to be there and, and the governors and so on. So he decided, this is ridiculous. We shouldn't be paying a tax on salt, uh, particularly for the, for the poor people that really couldn't afford it. So he walked uh, 380 kilometers from his hometown, which is just off the picture here. Uh, and he walked through all these towns and villages to the Atlantic, um, sorry, to the Arabian Sea here, where he then broke the salt law by harvesting salt on the shore. Now, the salt law actually remained in place until the British left. So his march had failed on that front. But what he did succeed in doing was uniting the country around a single desire to get rid of the British and start ruling India themselves. And the great thing was that this has now become somewhat of a heritage route and it's clearly signposted. So it meant my navigation became much easier. And I would just follow this dandy path all the way to dandy, which is uh, where he broke the salt law. And as I was walking through this area, I, tr I stayed with a lot of families. Um, and I remember this family in particular because they actually hosted Gandhi and the marchers when they came through their town back in the 1930s. So um, it gave me the opportunity to learn more about, you know, the kinds of things, the messages Gandhi was trying to communicate um, and, and the general sort of health of the, of the marchers. They actually also introduced me to uh, Mahatma Gandhi's great grandson, who I then uh, had the opportunity to meet down in Mumbai. India is intense. Um, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the least I can say about it, really. There are 1.3 billion people that live there, and over 60% of them live in really rural villages. And so, you know, I was walking through rural India, and every village I would pass through, people would call me over from the side of the road and give me a tea or a coffee or um, just they just want a conversation. But it really meant that I had no time to myself. Even though I was doing this journey solo, uh, I was always surrounded by people. Unless I really went hunting for it. And that's one thing I realized, you know, once I was out of the Himalayas, India is actually an incredibly flat country, which is great in one sense if you're walking it because you don't have any of those big hills or mountains to climb. And it was kind of a relief for a while. But it also means there's nothing on the horizon to look at or to aim for. And so it just seems like you're gliding through the landscape and, and nothing really changes. Um, so when I came across some mountains further south, just got this sudden burst of energy again and I, I really was excited about you know the journey that I was on and on the 6th of December I reached Kanyakumari which is the very southern tip of, uh, of India and it's where Gandhi's ashes uh, were scattered in fact they were rested in a temple um, which I'm at here and they were eventually scattered into the ocean and again it was a very strange feeling reaching that southern tip so this time there were loads of people around because it's a, a big sort of Indian pilgrim site but in reality there was no one else there that understood the journey I'd been on to get there so that's uh, a really quick uh, rush through my journey but hopefully it was informative and interesting um, 
but I'd love to get some questions from you guys. That's this is my favorite awesome. part. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Um, all right. You know what? Uh, Miss Pinger's class, I know that you guys need to go. You were sending me emails. So if you guys want to type in two questions really quick before you guys have to switch over, go for it. While you're typing, uh, we'll go to Mr. Laveau's class for one. Oh, that's that can actually, uh, you can hear you. So go right ahead, guys. Okay, thank you. Uh, Josiah, do you want to ask questions? Okay. Get in front of the camera so they can see it, Josiah. All right. Um, how do you train yourself to walk these great distances? That's a really good question. Um, I'm going to be honest, I don't train. Um, I probably should do, particularly the older I get. Um, things become a bit harder. But what I... I stay generally quite fit and active, um, but I always think that you know you're going on a journey and it's it's you're doing like the equivalent of a, a marathon, so you you sort of you get fitter as you go. Um, so I would start doing like you know, particularly in India, I would start doing maybe um, 20, 25 kilometers a day. And I'd eventually work my way up to about 35 to 40 kilometers in each day. So I just took it gradually to start with. And I got com more comfortable with the kit that I was carrying. You know, my bag was actually 27 kilos, um, which is a huge amount of weight to be carrying. So that was slowing me down. And, and just slowly but surely, I got fitter and fitter and more confident in how far I could do each day. Um, and there was one day where I did... Uh, 47 kilometers in a single day, which is, uh, well, that was stupid. <laughs> Holy. Um, all right. That's amazing. We're going to go quickly to Miss Painter's class. They just sent in a question, which is, did you ever experience a time with a shortage of food? Um, in India, it was, it was kind of funny because um, within, with the heat and everything, I just didn't feel like I needed to eat in the middle of the day. Um, I didn't really want anything weighing me down too much. So again, I would have a really light snack in the middle of the day. And sometimes that would literally just be a packet of biscuits. Um, and, uh, and then I'd make sure I'd load up in the evening. So obviously I'd have rice and, and curries and so on. Um, so I never experienced a time where we were, where I was kind of out of food. And India is an amazing place because they are so hospitable that actually you have to turn away food um, and it's really difficult they don't like you sort of declining food but you kind of need to um, sometimes because it's some of it is really heavy along the Amazon um, we took expedition ration packs so we we worked out how much food we needed for the whole journey and we actually took that with us in the kayaks so we always had some food but we were again, relatively limited in terms of what we would eat during the day. So we would have one meal in the, uh, in the evening, which generally was about 500 calories. We'd have the same in the morning. Um, we'd like have uh, porridge oats with uh, protein or we'd have like, um, the, well, the ration packs, they're kind of desserts ultimately. So custard or something like that. Um, but again, they're about 500 calories. And then our lunchtime meal, it worked out at roughly 500 calories, but it was protein and it just not very satisfying. Um, but we never, we never actually ran out of food. I think I returned back to the UK from the Amazon with about 12 packets left. So we budgeted really quite well. Well done. All right. The custard sounds lovely. Uh, second <laughs> question from Miss Pinker's class, uh, just because they had to go, is do you plan on doing another expedition like this? Um, yeah, I, I definitely will do. One thing I really enjoyed about this one is a, a meeting so many people um, and, and having those conversations, learning about them and their lifestyle. But actually, um, I have filmed my whole journey through India and I'm now making a documentary. And uh, it's, it's been a massive learning curve for me, age 35 or whatever I am, to, to learn a new skill. And... Um, that's something that I've now got a passion for. So I'm going to try and do some more journeys uh, and, and film them and share them. Because I think particularly historical journeys or journeys where I'm sharing information and history and so on with a community of people that don't necessarily know about it. Um, I've got one idea for South America. 
um, in Peru. Uh, so go back to Peru, um, but it's all to do with the Incas and ultimately Machu Picchu being the, the center of the Incan empire and all these routes that led used to lead to the city. So yeah, we'll see if that, that I can get that one off the ground. Very cool. Well, when you're done with the documentary, we'd love to share it with classes or at least point them in the direction of it. So please do keep us posted on that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. Let's go to Miss O'Brien's class. You guys have a question. Go ahead, Jackson. Yes, we do. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Jackson. How long did it take you to walk to walk there? To walk India? How long did the travel take? Yeah. Um, so the, the whole journey was four and a half thousand kilometers so that's about 2600 miles and it took me seven and a half months uh, which was a little bit longer than i'd anticipated but i had some problems in the mountains with um i got really bad blisters on my feet uh, i got food poisoning and um because i was filming the journey my camera actually broke when i got to delhi uh, and i had to wait for it there to be repaired so that again took like a week uh, or that wait that actually took me two weeks um, before I could leave Delhi, which was infuriating. Having got myself into a routine to then be effectively grounded uh, in one place, but yeah, the whole journey was seven and a half months. Excellent. All right, let's go up to Scotland. If you guys have a question, uh, yep, two se seconds. Uh, take your time. Yeah. What's well, been your favourite journey so far? Well, that's a really difficult question because both journeys were very different. Um, so the, the Amazon journey was more of a personal thing. I, I really wanted to go there and uh, do a big expedition, spend some time living in the, in the jungle and the rainforest. The India expedition was very much about the history and learning about the history and being a, a vehicle to sharing those stories that I was hearing and learning about um so they were very different i i think i'd go back to the jungle again <laughs> having having been to the jungle twice now I, I would definitely go back and i'd love to do that the favorite part of my amazon journey was actually the red zone the dangerous part because that's where the jungle felt really intimate and we were kind of living um amongst sort of the communities and, and really in the rainforest. Further down, the river was so wide, so actually it, it didn't feel like we were really in the forest. Cool. All right. Uh, Mr. Richard's class, uh, I know we guys we can't hear you guys, but again, uh, blue chat bar top left, type in a question, and I'll pass it along whenever you're done. Uh, that works too for classes that might be watching online on YouTube live. If there are any classes, you can submit questions in the chat bar and I can pass them on. Uh, but while we're waiting for that, we'll go to back to Mr. Lavoe's class. You guys have a question? Uh, uh, Taylor, Taylor, you had a question? Um, how many times did you almost die? It sounded like his journey was very harrowing. They want to know if there were like near-death experiences. <laughs> um, so uh, the Amazon, yeah, there were a couple of near-death experiences. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't so bad. Um, I, I always sort of hype it up a bit, but it, when you sort of you plan for for some eventualities like that, so that was why we tried to mitigate as much as possible by having a guide through the red zone, um, making sure that we had a really good medical kit. Uh, we took a satellite phone with us as well, so that meant that I could call the UK or you know call the emergency services or a, a doctor if needed um even if we were in the middle of nowhere so you know we try and mitigate as much as possible but there are always certain circumstances and situations which you you just have to deal with when the time comes um, and that might be coming face to face with pirates or something like that um and you just have to really work uh, work out what you can do in the moment india on the other hand was I think an incredibly safe country to be traveling through. Um, I, I really didn't experience any problems at all. Um, uh, you know, I was walking with my camera being visible and I never got um, approached or sort of uh, confronted by anyone um, 
anyone dangerous. I generally think that the people are 99.9% .9 of the people out there are friendly and they're just interested in you. And it's the 0.01% that you, you may unfortunately come across, um, but you, you know, fingers crossed you never do. That's a great message, but I, I do like the juxtaposition between, I had several near death experiences, but it was, it was all good. <laughs> <laughs> uh all right so mr richard's class again if you guys want to type in a question top left of your screen blue chat bar go for it uh while we're waiting for that we'll go back to Ms. o'brien's class you guys the second one come on up okay thank you um i'm wondering if you ever did figure out what bit your ankle um i didn't no uh i because i never saw it i have no idea what it was some some people in so when we got to the village 50 kilometers away we obviously got out and we took a break and things and i showed some people the little mark on the side of my ankle and they said oh it could be a, like a small stingray or something like that um but uh, and, they, and you do see them uh, they're sort of plate sized they're about that big and you do see them in the shallows of the river sometimes but they said you know if if you'd been stung by a stingray you would not be walking for at least six weeks um so the fact that i was you know walking around within six hours was was a good thing but yeah that was, that was a terrifying experience to actually not know what's going on what your body's doing and knowing that you you know it, it's you're totally out of control you're in the hands of of nature at that point and you what, what your body can deal with yeah, it could have been a small stingray or something like that, but I don't know. Maybe since you're the sort of person who can, you know, kayak the entire Amazon River and like walk 40 kilometers a day, you're just really tough and six hours for you is just, <laughs> that's your standard of stingray recovery. Uh, <laughs> Miss Painter's class asked, uh, what's the coolest animal you heard or saw in the Amazon? Um, I mean... <sighs> As I said, like the, the river widens out quite quickly. So a lot of the animals that you kind of imagine to live in the jungle actually spend all of their time inside the rainforest and they don't tend to come down to the main river. They'll come down to the tributaries that, that join that main river. Um, but we, we camped on sandbanks where there were crocodile footprints, um, which was pretty terrifying because we didn't notice them when we set the tents up and it was only when the sun started to go down and we noticed the shadows and we're like, we saw the, 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 the bodies, um, you know, the crocodile claw footprints up the sand and then their bodies obviously just having dragged the sand up and around. And there were hundreds of them all up this beach. And we thought, oh, we don't know what to do because it's, it's literally getting dark as we'd set the tents up. Um, so we just, we managed to pick up our tents. We climbed up a little cliff, took our tents up there and slept up there. But um, yeah, so like crocodiles, jaguar footprints as well. Um, they were on some of the beaches that we stayed on, uh, particularly mama and baby footprints. Um, and we did, I think the coolest animal was probably actually a sloth, which we, um, which we saw up in a tree and it was really close to us. So, and we actually got out the kayaks and did a little walk around the tree to have a really close look. But yeah, that was, that was quite magical. Excellent. Uh, all right, let's go back to Scotland. Here's our second question. Okay. What was the weather like? Did you hear that? I no, didn't. And what was the weather like? Yeah. What was the weather like? Um, in India, I experienced all kinds of weather so right up in the mountains it was very dry to start with um, but as I climbed up that first mountain tons of snow um, and the road is normally closed most of the year and the army try and keep it open so that um, they can get supplies to the communities there and so on but yeah there was really bad snow up there uh, and then as I came out of the mountains uh, you get the monsoon in India so not only does that make it incredibly hot and you get about you kind of get about two months worth of really intense heat and i'm talking 45 i think that the highest i saw on my phone um was about 48 degrees 
So that was insanely hot. And I was trying to walk through that. So it was really important that I kept hydrated. But then you get these incredible rainstorms and it's just consistent rain for literally four days at a time. Um, and I'd have to walk through that because I was, you know, wanting to continue my journey. I would just have to walk through the rain. And then as I came further south, you know, the monsoon was in India for about three months. Um, so by the time I got further south, things really started to get much nicer. Um, it's a lot greener in the south. And, you know, it was really pleasant walking. Um, and I would happily walk in, you know, short sleeves um, throughout the whole day. And, yeah. So, um, yeah, loads of different kind of climates and conditions. Um, my favorite, I think, was favorite area was obviously when it was nice and sunny but not too hot um it wasn't that blistering 48 degrees but uh yeah the southern part of india has a really nice climate excellent uh all right so mr richards did get in touch via youtube live so i can pass on his first question similar to one you've already fielded but other than your sloth what kind of animals did you see you had mentioned birds earlier is there anything that really stood out are there lots of things or um I mean, you get, well, in, in, uh, in the Amazon, um, because you, you actually start in the mountains, um, or I, we started in the mountains near the source of the river, and up there you get some, uh, I guess they're kind of like deer, they're called vicunias, um, and you see them, they're really, they're wild, and they sort of hop about the landscape there. Um, generally, it's, you kind of have to stay still to see wildlife. Um, and it was the same in India. You know, I didn't see a huge amount of wildlife in the mountains. I saw some ibex, which are, they're kind of like mountain goats, but much bigger. And they've got these incredible horns. Um, so they, yeah, I saw some, some of those up in India. Um, but yeah, you, don't, you just don't, unless you sit still, you don't see as much wildlife as you kind of imagine you would do. Now, there was one time in India where, as I was heading south, Someone said, oh, what are you going to do to avoid being attacked by a tiger? And I hadn't considered the fact that there were tigers just freely roaming about um, in areas that I would be walking through. And so I looked at my maps and there was a particular area which was all covered in forest. It was a, an enclave of forest and I just walked straight into it. And it would be two weeks at least if I wanted to go north and then find a diversion. So I just thought I'm going to have to walk through this national park and I phoned up the, the national park rangers and I said look is there any way you can either walk with me or shadow me or something and they said no chance um, so I thought well I'm just going to do it myself uh, so I hired a taxi and I had a taxi following me for a whole day it was petrifying walking through this national park and there were constant signs of you know leopards roam this area do not get out of your car. There are tigers here, elephants. Uh, all of these signs were telling me that I should not be walking. But having that, the safety of a car driving behind me, and he drove behind me for eight hours at five kilometers an hour. Um, and I got through, luckily unscathed. But yeah, it was definitely, you know, my heart was racing for that whole day, that whole period of time. I guess actually, sorry. Um, for those that didn't join, uh, the other animal that I saw um, in Shimla, we had a monkey join us on, on the live stream. So, um, yeah, there were loads of monkeys all over India. And, uh, yeah, you guys got to see one back in, I think it was June. If, if any of the classes go to YouTube, you can watch that clip. It's like it's in the middle of the hangout. It's like, wait, I've got to show you this monkey by the window, and it's amazing. So it's like my favorite exploring by the seat of your pants <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. Uh, all right, we're getting close to the end, so what we'll do is we'll have one last question from Scotland, because you guys are joining us from so far away. So take it away, guys. Any last questions? Sure, two seconds. Rebecca? Would you ever like to visit Scotland? Would, Would you like ever have an adventure in Scotland? I've, um, well, no, I've sort of done a little bit of it. I did John O'Groats to Land's End, um, so top to bottom of the UK. Uh, I really enjoyed that. My Scotland section, I think, was three days. 
Um, and it, it was a, it's a magical place, Scotland. It's so, so beautiful and um, really, really friendly people there. So I would love to come and do the North Coast 500. So that's a circular route uh, sort of around the coastline of Scotland and then back across through the locks um, back to where you started. I'd love to do that. Um, and yeah, I'd love to come and visit the Outer Hebrides as well. Uh, so I keep on seeing pictures on Instagram and Facebook and just think I've got to get myself up there. So I will come to Scotland at some point. Um, and in, in the UK, I'm going to try and do some uh, like a speaking tour uh, around schools. So uh, if you guys do get in touch, then I might be able to come and swing by your classroom as well. Excellent. I love how to you, like the crossing the UK adventure is like minimal compared to your main two that doesn't even feature in your, your bigger story. So thank you for that. That uh, says a lot. Uh, all right. At the end of every hangout, guys, what we do is I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. So Mr. Laveau's class, Ms. O'Brien's class. Uh, Scott, like, could you guys join me in saying a big thank you to Ollie? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ollie. <laughs> Awesome. That was great, guys. Great questions. Uh, thanks so much for joining us again for, I think, the seventh, eighth time, Ollie. That was awesome. That was good. Yeah, I love it. And, Thank you so much for having me. We look forward to that documentary. Can't hardly wait. Yes. It and, should be done by uh, beginning of August. It should be should be ready and done. We'll, we'll keep our eyes peeled. And for your Scottish adventure and the documentary from that as well. Yes. <laughs>